Are you seeking fulfillment for your life? Do you want freedom from fear? That's why we're here. Welcome to Jesus 101, introducing you to the real Jesus. And now, here's your host, Elizabeth Talbot. Hello, I greet you in the name of the Lord with great joy and very excited that we will be able to spend some time together studying the scriptures. We're going to start with our first lecture uh, with four principles of interpretation that are general principles of interpretation in the Bible. Then we will go specifically to the four Gospels, which are the core of the history of redemption when Jesus Christ lived on this earth and died on our behalf and resurrected to guarantee our salvation. So I will start this lecture, this first hour we're going to spend together, talking about four general principles of interpretation. The word in English for interpreting the Bible is hermeneutics. It's a way that we learn principles that will apply any part in the scriptures so that we can see overall the general um, setting of the Bible and what is the core teaching of the Bible. So if you have a pen or paper, you will need um, your Bible. You will need something to write uh, with and something to write on. So you're going to need paper, pen, and Bible at all times because we're going to go through many different details and history and geography and many other things. So I hope you are ex excited as I am to dive into the scriptures. So if you um, put in your paper, we're going to do number one, number two, number three, and number four. So this whole hour together will concentrate on these four principles of interpreting the Bible, hermeneutical principles. The first one that we are going to talk about is trying to see what is the whole Bible about? How do we interpret the Bible? What is the core teaching of the Bible? For that, we're going to start in the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to take instructions from Jesus himself, who actually taught us how to interpret all of the Bible, not just the New Testament. So come with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, the third Gospel in the New Testament, the last chapter, this is after Jesus has resurrected from the dead. We have a very interesting story here that is only found in the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke chapter 24 and is uh, the way to Emmaus. When the disciples, there's two disciples, go into the village of Emmaus and they think all is lost. And they don't understand that Jesus has died and resurrected. And so they're talking among themselves on Luke chapter 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Of course, they didn't know it was Jesus. So verse 17, he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still, looking sad. They stopped walking because they, they couldn't believe somebody didn't know what had happened that weekend. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and aware of all these things? And then they go on to tell him that Jesus was supposed to be the redeemer of Israel and he has died and they're sad because all their hopes are gone and all their dreams are gone. So Jesus will teach them how to interpret the scriptures in this particular passage. So I'm going to take it from these verses all the way to verse 25. Luke chapter 24 verse 25. This is where our first principle will start. He said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe, in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And here it is, verse 27. So I want to make sure that you uh, underline this verse in your Bibles or in your papers. Luke chapter 24, 
we're going to start specifically on verse 27. And he says here, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So what he did, he took Moses. Moses means the first five books of the Bible, which we call the law. And then he also took the prophets. And he said to them, look, the whole thing was about me. All the Bible, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well, was written so that you could understand what I came to do. So beginning with Moses, which is called the Pentateuch in Greek, or the Torah in Hebrew, the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. This word explained in the Greek, dear menua, is where we get the word hermeneutics that I was telling you about. Is how do you interpret scripture? And here he said to them, this is how you interpret it. All the law and all the prophets, the whole of the Old Testament, really were talking about that it was necessary for the Christ to come and die and be resurrected. He uh, told them this, they got so excited to understand that all the scriptures that they knew, because don't forget, most of the, uh, all the disciples were Jews, okay? So Jesus says, look, the cross this weekend, and what I did on the cross is what the whole of scripture is about, not just the New Testament. All of Moses and all the prophets were talking about me. These two disciples got so excited about this first principle of interpretation that they ran back to Jerusalem to tell the rest of the disciples. When they're speaking to all the rest of the disciples, Jesus appears himself. And this is how the Gospel of Luke actually ends. And in verse 44, he will repeat it to the rest of the disciples, not just for the two that were going to Emmaus, but not for all the disciples who would start the Christian church in the first century. And he said this to them, verse 44, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me, says Jesus, and now he gives the formula for the whole Old Testament. In the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. So if you are going to uh, summarize all the Old Testament, it would be these three parts, law, prophets, and Psalms. And Jesus says, look, all these people, the whole law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms were speaking about me. So you need to learn the Bible, he says, so that you know that you have new glasses, and the glasses are what happened this weekend. I died and resurrected. And so go back and read the Law of Moses, go back and read the prophets, go back and read the Psalms, knowing that the whole thing in the Bible is about me, says Jesus. Okay, so then, verse 45, he opened their minds. And this is so interesting because the verb used in the Greek original for opened is the same verb that was used when Jesus opened the mouth of those who couldn't speak and open the ears of the ones who couldn't hear, or open the eyes of the blind. Same word, except that this time he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. See, the disciples knew the scriptures because all Jewish people were actually trained in the scriptures, but they had not understood the scriptures. This, this verb understand in Greek would be better translated as connect the dots. It's like you have this dot here and this dot here and this dot here and this dot here. You have uh, uh, Israel in Egypt and you have Israel in the exile in Babylon and you have all these things and they're like dots, but you never connected that all of these things were teaching us something about Jesus, who he is, what he came to do and what he accomplished. So Jesus says, look, you have to learn the whole Bible again, and I'm going to open your minds so that you can understand the scriptures. At this moment, I would like to pray with you, asking the Holy Spirit to come upon you at this very moment and open our minds together so that what we're going to study will teach us that every verse, 
in the Bible, every narrative in the Bible actually teaches us something about Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, how important it is for us to open your word at this moment. But we actually need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand. So open our minds too, that we may be able to connect the dots and see the beauty of the plan of salvation from Genesis all the way to Revelation, because that's what the Bible is for, to explain to us what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the first point that we are going to call then a prin uh, principle of interpretation is that all of the Bible, so this is our first point of interpretation, is that all of the Bible, all of it, is about Jesus and the plan of salvation. So if you draw a cross and you put Luke chapter 24, and if you want verses, we can put both. The ones that uh, he talked to the two disciples in Emmaus, which was um, 27. And we can also put the one when he talked to the rest of the disciples. And explain to them that the whole uh, Old Testament, law, prophets, and psalms, which is the whole formula for the Old Testament, which was the Bible that the Jews used, all of it was about Jesus. So this would be 44 and 45. Okay, so the first principle, let's, let's recap to make sure we understood it, is that the whole Bible is concentrating on the cross, all of the Old Testament is pointing to the cross, and all of the New Testament is interpreting or explaining the cross. So this is the basic way you have to interpret. So if you start in Genesis, or if you start in Exodus, or in Leviticus, or in Psalms, or in Isaiah, and you don't know how what you're reading has to do with Jesus, you need to go a little deeper until you find how, what it has to do with Jesus. Okay, very good. So that's our first principle of interpretation, that the whole Bible, all of it, is about the cross and the plan of salvation. Very good. Now we have the second principle of interpretation. This principle tells us that the revelation that God gave to humanity is progressive, which means that we... Um, start with the smallest at the beginning, the smallest revelation of God, and then it keeps growing until we'll find meaning on everything in light of the cross. So the first thing we're going to write is revelation. Revelation is progressive, which means that it grows. Okay, so it grows, it's progressive. So think about it like this. We are growing and growing in Revelation, each time more light on the same topic. I'm going to give you an example. If you think of the Passover, see, this is a good, this is a good drawing for the progressive Revelation. As, as we go on in the Bible, we understand more of the same thing. So let's, let's talk about the Passover. So, for example, you start with uh, the Passover in Exodus 12 to 14. The Passover, the people of Israel are in Egypt. They uh, have been there 400 years, and God comes and says, I'm going to deliver you, and tonight is the night. So you can imagine everybody excited. They're leaving slavery. But there's one little thing they have to do. And if you go back and read in Exodus 12 to 14, they are going to kill a little lamb called a Passover lamb. Passed over. In this case, they're going to put blood on the dentils uh, and the dentil of the door on the side, on the top. And whoever's inside the house where the blood is, they're going to be passed over the angel of judgment. Nothing will happen to them. They will be delivered. And, and the blood of the lamb is what decides if they are safe or not. So this is the, the, first, the first part of this, this understanding of the Passover. 
As you follow this topic throughout the Bible, through the law, the Psalms, the prophet, every time you get a little more and more and more meaning on it. So then eventually 40 years later, you know, they get redeemed right away from the Red Sea, they cross it. A few years later, 40 years later, they cross to the promised land. They take the Passover again, and there's more meaning to it. Now they have crossed over because of the blood of the Lamb. But when we start getting to the New Testament, then we're being told, you know what? The, the Passover Lamb is really Jesus. Jesus dies on Passover Friday, exactly at the time of the Passover sacrifice, which was the ninth hour, which is three in the afternoon. And then we go, wow, so this, this thing that we understood here and that we understood a little bit more here and that we understood a little bit more here, every time gets added more meaning until we say, oh, Jesus is the Passover lamb. And, and then when he's taking the Passover, he says, from now on, you're gonna do this in remembrance of me. Because the cup and the bread that you were eating at the Passover is my body and is my blood that is being shed for you. And so when we get to the book of Revelation, and again there are plagues, and, and again all these things are happening that were happening here, now we understand that whoever is covered by the blood of the Lamb that Jesus shed on the cross is safe from any judgment at the end of times. Okay, so this is very, very important to understand because every topic in the Bible will have a progressive understanding. So we start with the smallest understanding, then with more, without, avo without voiding the original revelation, we get more and more and more added to it. Okay, so let's, let's look at some topics that you can see that, that um, the whole Bible is written this way. So that when you are studying a topic, you don't stay in the first understanding of that topic. That's just only the beginning. But don't forget that Revelation will always grow from the beginning to understanding that Revelation in light of the cross, because that's the number one <clears throat> hermeneutical principle. Okay? Um, let's read this principle in one of the passages of Scripture so that you can understand it. And then we'll review some topics that go from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Each time a little bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in understanding. Okay? Uh, uh, a book in the Bible that does this a lot is the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews takes all of the Old Testament main topics and it says, look. Now we understand that all of the Old Testament was pointing to Christ, that these were only the symbols, what we call the types of Christ, but that Christ is the real thing, that Christ is the full meaning of this doctrine or this understanding or this institution or this structure or whatever it may be, okay? From the sanctuary to the temple to, to the Sabbath to the Passover to all these topics, we're pointing to something that is the meaning in Christ. Okay? All right, let's look at the book of Hebrews. If you want to, on your own, study the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is based on the premise that the priests of the Old Testament were teaching us something about the priest, the priest, that is Jesus Christ. That the sacrifices of the Old Testament are teaching us something about the sacrifice that is the Lamb of God in Jesus Christ. That the promises of the Old Testament were pointing to the promises of, of the new covenant, etc., etc. Okay? But the principle of the fact that Revelation is progressive is at the very beginning of the book because the author wants to make sure we understood this. So chapter 1 of Hebrews, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews chapter 1. Verses 1 to 3. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. So that's how he starts. In the past, he spoke through the prophets, the fathers, in many portions and in many ways. Now, verse 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. 
So he says, yes, we started, he says, with the patriarchs, the fathers, and the prophets, yes, prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through the Son. And he says, the Son is, let's keep reading. It's very interesting. Verse 2. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He, Jesus, the Son, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, which means that all of these are very important because they were the shadows, the symbols, the beginning of the understanding of all of this. Okay, so don't forget, we have the, the, the symbol in the Old Testament and we have the substance in the New Testament. Um, this is not just for words like lamb or Passover. The whole Bible is this way. So whatever you learn in the Old Testament is pointing to something in the New Testament. So it's progressive. Every time you get a little more, a little more, a little more. Until on the cross, you, you go, ta-da, see? It was all about Jesus, and now we understand the full meaning of this. The Bible is primarily the letter from God that teaches us how God saved the human race. It has many other functions, the Bible. It can be a good ethical guide, how we live, how we love our neighbor, um, how to be a good person, etc., etc. Those are additional functions of the Bible. But the primary core function of the Bible is the fact that the Bible is the revelation of how God saved his children from the devil. Okay? So uh, the revelation keeps growing. All right, very good. So let's see which topics is important to understand this way. Well, because the topics go from the beginning to the end of the Bible, we will find, let's, let's do the, the pattern again, many topics. I'm going to start with one, just to give you an example. I'm going to start with paradise. Just to give you an example. So let's start in Genesis. Okay? Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, says that God decided to have children in his image. This is a very important topic for the rest of the Bible. Um, and when he has children in his image, he, um, let's read it. Chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. God said, let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish, etc., etc. Verse 27, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created. Muy bien. So now that we have this, what does that have to do with anything? Well, that's the beginning of the whole Bible. Because God will take his children and put them in a very special place. Even though he created all of the world for them, now he creates a little special place for them. And it's called the Garden of Eden, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. The Lord God planted a garden. Now I need to stop here and remind you of one thing. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So all of the Old Testament originally was written in Hebrew. But 200 years before Christ, it was translated into Greek. Because a lot of the Jews dispersed through Asia. Many people didn't speak Hebrew anymore. So it was translated into Greek. The Greek translation, you don't need to remember this, but it's called the Septuagint. Uh, it comes from the word 70. And uh, if you see in the commentaries, the name of this Bible is always in Roman numbers, LXX, called the Septuagint. Septuagint. By the way, this is the Bible that the New Testament writers will use when they are quoting the Old Testament. 
So when the New Testament writers, the gospel writers, everybody in the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, they're using the Greek version of the Bible, which is the Septuagint. Well, why did I tell you this? Well, because I want you to know what the word for garden is in the Greek. The Lord God planted a garden. The word in Greek is paradisus, where we get the word paradise. So the name of the Garden of Eden <laughs> was paradise. And in this paradise was a very special tree. Verse 9, out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. And, in, and the tree of life was in the middle of the garden. Now, the tree of life was a symbol of, of the fact that they were eternal because they were in the image of God. So every day they would eat of this fruit. We don't know what the fruit was. So today I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to just uh, draw a little fruit. This is the fruit of the tree of life. That is where? Well, it's in the paradise of God. Okay, very good. So at the beginning, we get paradise. And this is where the people of God and the children were supposed to live forever. So we have Genesis chapter 2, 8 and 9. Okay. So they were supposed to live forever, eating of this fruit that symbolized their connection to the life giver who is God, who is eternal. In chapter 3 of Genesis, the kidnapper comes along, somebody who will kidnap the children of God, convince them that they, um, they shouldn't follow God, that God does not have their best interest in mind. And he takes the children of God. And God promises, chapter 3 of Genesis, this is at the very beginning of the Bible. God promises that he's going to come back for his children and get them back. Okay, from the kidnapper. And the first promise that we call covenant is in Genesis 3.15, where God says, I'm going to crush your head, uh, it says to the serpent. Okay, but unfortunately, they lose paradise. Chapter 3 of Genesis says that they could not continue eating from the tree of life because now they, had, they were mortals. They, there was death because of sin. And so chapter 3 of Genesis at the end is very sad. They have to leave the garden. They have to leave paradise. And they can no longer eat from the tree of life. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse uh, 24 he drove the men out and, uh, at the east of the garden, Paradisus, of Eden. He stationed the cherubim, an angel, and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. They could no longer access the tree of life. But this is not where the Bible ends. This is where the Bible begins. So when you go to the last book of the Bible, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, you will find something very interesting. You will find that all those who believe in the blood of the Lamb through Jesus Christ, they're again in paradise. Chapter 22, uh, for example, let's start in the beginning of Revelation. You start hearing the same language that you heard back in Genesis, now at the end of the Bible. Chapter 2, for example, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear which the Spirit says to the churches, him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise, same word, paradisos, of God. So when we are in Revelation, we are again eating of the tree of life. We are again in paradise. But how did that happen? How did that happen? If we did not have access here, how can we have access again at the, at the end? So if you start looking in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, we get the same words that we got uh, in Genesis. As a matter of fact, the last chapter of the Bible has all the redeemed standing by the tree of life again. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, which means wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb, 
A revelation already explained that before in chapter 7, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash the robes that they may have the right to what? To the tree of life. So we started in the tree of life. We ended in the, re in the revelation at the end of times back with God in the tree of life. So when did we get access to the tree of life and paradise? Well, that's a good question. And that's what the whole Bible is about. How did God get us back to the same place? And of course, the answer is in the Gospels when Jesus dies. In the Gospel of Luke, um, chapter 23, Jesus is dying on the cross. The thief on the cross is next to him and asks him that he will be remembered when Jesus comes. And Jesus answers this, chapter 23 of Luke, verse 43. He said to him, Truly I say to you today, you shall be with me, where? In paradise is the same exact word, paradise. And it's the only time in all four gospels that Jesus uses the word paradise. Because here in the middle of his dying, he, he is opening up again, the way to paradise. So the very cross of Christ is guaranteeing that the thief on the cross will again have access to paradise and be able to eat from the tree of life because now eternity was again available. Okay. The whole Bible is a full circle. It starts in the paradise we lose paradise. Jesus Christ gains access by dying on our behalf because the, the wages of sin is death. And then we end up the Bible again in paradise. All the topics of the Bible are that way. Not just the topic of paradise. All of them. Whether you're talking about Passover, whether you're talking about the Exodus, whether you're talking about the temple and the tabernacle uh, or the Sabbath or any topic that you find that is a major topic in the scriptures is all pointing to something that Jesus would accomplish for the human race. Okay. Now, let me give you some more of these topics because uh, once we understand um, the fact that all of the Bible is progressive in revelation, taking us closer and closer to Jesus Christ, then we, um, we are in, in, for the first time in a position where we can interpret the scriptures appropriately with the principle that Jesus gave us, that all the law, the prophets, and the Psalms are about him. So one of the topics that we just discussed is paradise. The first three chapters of Genesis are reversed in the last three chapters of Revelation. Because the whole, the whole Bible has symmetry. It starts and ends with the same topic. So Genesis 1, the creation of the world. Genesis 2, intimacy between God and his children face to face. Chapter 3 of Genesis, sin enters the, wor the world. The kidnapper takes away the children. They become mortals. Chapter 20 of Revelation, this, the, the devil, the serpent is destroyed. There is no more sin. Chapter 21 of Revelation, God is now dwelling with his people and he sees them face to face, and he will be their God, and they will be his people, which is the covenant formula throughout the whole of scripture. Chapter 22, the recreation of the earth has the tree of life again. We are back in paradise, and the full humankind has come full circle, and is now where it was at the very beginning. Because God is trying to reveal that the cross made this possible, there are many topics in the Bible that you can study this way. For example, 
the Exodus. The Exodus teaches us redemption, how God redeemed us from Egypt. But this is just the beginning. As you follow this topic, you will find that the real Exodus uh, happened at the cross, where Jesus opened the way out of slavery to redeem us. And the word Exodus is used many times in the Greek and in the Hebrew to, to point us to a place where we will be uh, redeemed and free. For example, in Luke chapter 9, verse 31, we have the transfiguration account. And Moses and Elijah show up to strengthen Jesus before the crucifixion. And in this verse, it says that they are talking to him about the exodus that he would accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, of course, um, sometimes we miss, miss these things because they're in the original. But can you imagine Moses from the first exodus now talking to Jesus in Jerusalem about the real exodus that he's about to, um, to, to accomplish? And if you go to uh, chapter uh, for example, 14 or 15 in Exodus, when they are freed from slavery, they sing a new song, okay? Exodus chapter 15, all the people of Israel are singing a song. And the song is about how they were redeemed. Chapter 15, Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, and you can read the whole song, Exodus 15. So they cross the sea. They're singing this new song. It's called the Song of Moses in your Bibles. When, when Jesus accomplishes the Exodus in the Gospels, and we realize that this was only a symbol of redemption of the whole humankind, then when we get to the book of Revelation, something amazing happens. Go to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15. So we have here in Revelation 15, everybody again standing by the sea again. Remember like Exodus 15? Revelation 15 verse 2. I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And look what they sang, verse 3. They sang the song of Moses. Remember the song of Moses from Exodus 15? They sang the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Because the song is the same one. Of, of, of Moses is at the beginning. Because they're just understanding the beginning of it. But now they get the whole thing. That the whole human race has been delivered from slavery. Not just Israel from Egypt. And so they sing now the song of Moses that is also the song of the Lamb. And it says, mighty are your works, O Lord. So um, how important it is to understand that all, all topics, whether it is Passover or Exodus or Paradise, all these topics uh, are related to Jesus from beginning to the end of the Bible. For example, another topic like this is the Sabbath. You know that the Sabbath was kept by the Jews from the beginning uh, the seventh day, God created intimacy with his people after creation. But the actual word Sabbath in Hebrew, Shabbat, which means rest, uh, was given for the first time in the Bible in Exodus 15, 16. This is where the people of Israel were going to learn that God was their provider because they needed manna. And, and every day they would get manna, except on, the, on Friday, they would get twice so that on the seventh day, which was called Shabbat, the Sabbath, they would remember that God was their provider. But that was the first beginning understanding of the Sabbath. Then in Exodus 20, God teaches them that he's their creator and that they're going to stop on this day to remember that they were created by the God of heaven and earth. But then it continues. So you have uh, Deuteronomy, where the law is going to be read again. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. Now they're told to keep the Sabbath so that they understand that they have been redeemed from slavery, that they were slaves and now they're free. So it's progressing from provider to creator to redeemer. Well, when we get to the New Testament, we understand that it was Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, and that Jesus 
is the reason why we rest. Because, uh, and I'm going to give you a text just in case you want. Hebrews 4, chapter 9 and 10, it says, We rest from our works in Christ because His works have accomplished our salvation. So on this day, we celebrate not just our creation, but our redemption. So all the topics in the Bible are this way. They are progressive. They teach us a meaning. Um, and the meaning is Jesus, all of them. There is one topic that in our next lecture I will discuss with you, which is the topic, I believe, that encompasses all of the Bible from beginning to end, where all doctrines, all understandings, all studies uh, actually um, make sense. So I'm going to leave that one for, for the next lecture. So we have the first principle being it's all about Jesus, Old, T Old Testament, New Testament. Second principle, all the revelation is progressive, which means we get a little at the beginning and it grows, it grows, it grows, it grows until we understand that the whole thing was about Jesus Christ, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Because the whole Bible is about Jesus, it's very important that you do what we call a historical map of the Bible. Historical map so that you understand how the plan of salvation is progressing in the Bible. Um, so I'm going to do this historical map for you right now, and you need to write, <laughs> because we're going to do from the beginning to the end of the Bible just in this board, so that whenever you're telling a story, whether it's about David or Moses or Samuel or Jesus, you have to know where that is in the plan of salvation, because the whole Bible is the plan of salvation. So it's important that we don't think that the stories are there for the story's sake. We, they're there to teach us something about the plan of salvation. So let's do this historical map. We are number three, okay? So we're going to do now number three. So let's start with Adam. Adam is the first person that, that receives the covenant from God that says, I'm coming back for my children, even though I lost them to a kidnapper, okay? So we have Adam, we have Noah, then we have Abraham, then we have Moses, then we have David, and then we have Jesus. These six people are the main six characters in the covenantal line of the history of redemption. Even though the covenant will be given many, many times in between, these are the main six. Because on each one of them, we get more added, more understanding, more meaning to the covenant that God made with the human race. So uh, let's follow it. So from Adam at the very beginning, Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we're moving to the flood. Noah, Genesis 6 to 9. Then we get Abraham. Now Abraham uh, receives a covenant that says that through his seed, through his descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So we're starting to get a little more information that the, the Messiah, the Redeemer, would come from the line of Abraham, okay? Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Now, Jacob, is his name is changed to Israel. Israel will become the father of the people of Israel, which are 12 tribes, 12 sons that will become the 12 tribes. Okay, so, so far over here, we are only in the book of Genesis in the Bible, okay? Now, Jacob, Israel, will have the sons and eventually will move to Egypt, and they will be slaves here 400 years. And then Moses will deliver them. Now, one thing that is very important to understand is that the people of God will be growing in size and in identity as the Bible grows. 
So here, when we start with Abraham, we have the people of God. Because we're, it's just a family. When we get to Moses, actually, we're going to do it a little different so that it's easier. We're going to do the family of God. That's going to be easier to understand. The family of God. In Moses' time, we have the nation or the people of God. Because now they are formally made into a constitution, a people, an identity, a race, and a social religious group. When we get to David, we have the kingdom of God. Because now it will be the kingdom of Israel will, will be at that time, especially under Solomon that follows, the greatest kingdom on earth of that time. Okay? So it grows from family to people to kingdom as the Bible goes. Very good. So Moses will deliver the people of Israel. They will cross to the promised land. And David will be the first great king, even though they have another king before named Saul. David will be the great king that will conquer and expand the territory. He will have a son named Solomon. Under Solomon, the territory of Israel will go from Egypt to the Euphrates River, which was the covenant that God made with Abraham, that his descendants would own the land from Egypt to the Euphrates River in Babylon or the Mesopotamia area. Um, under Solomon, the covenant of the geography that God promised Abraham will become true. Eventually, the kingdom divides. And it divides in two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. After the exile, they come back. They rebuild the temple in the 400s or so before Christ. So let's put some dates. Let's see if we can put some dates here. All right. Let's put some dates so that we know where we are. So here in David, we are in 1000 BC. The northern kingdom is taken by Assyria in 722 BC. The southern kingdom, where Jerusalem is, is taken by Babylon in 587 BC. So they come back together after the exile. They rebuild the temple. Then we have the Greek Empire in the 330 BC. And then we have the Roman Empire. And Jesus is born under the Roman Empire. And all of the New Testament is written on the first century of the Christian era under the Roman Empire. So this is the whole history of the Bible. Um, what is very important is that when you are teaching anything, for example, if I ask you, all of you know the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah, the prophet who was told to go and preach to Nineveh. We have a whole book with his name in the Old Testament, the book of Jonah. And he didn't want to go and... and he went to the storm and they threw him from the ship and a big fish swallowed him and he prayed to God in the belly of the, of the fish and, you know, God gave him another chance and he went and preached to Nineveh. That is a nice story and he talks about the power of God and he talks about repentance and he talks about second chances. But unless you link it to the cross, you haven't found the deep meaning of this story. So if I ask you, where is Jonah here? Many of us would have a hard time finding where this story is in the storyline of the Bible. See, Adam, all the way to Joseph, which is one of the sons of Jacob, is the book of Genesis. Moses starts with Exodus. And we have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Here we have the historical books. We have 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Kings. All the prophets are right, these are the prophets. All the prophets are right before, during, or after the exile. All the prophets. So if Jonah is a prophet, he would have to be in the section right before, 
during or after the exile. So there you get a little closer. Now, when you study Jonah a little bit deeper, you'll find out that he is right before the exiles. He is in the northern kingdom um, about 100 years before the Assyrians will take over uh, the northern kingdom. And God tells him to go with a message of forgiveness to the Assyrians who have been bothering them and, and uh, burning their crops and, and doing war with them for many a long time before they actually take him. So, so Jonah lives about 100 years before they take him. And Nineveh in 722 will be the capital of the Assyrians, but it's not yet in the time of Jonah, but it's still a big city of 120,000 inhabitants, says the book of Jonah. Well, Jonah doesn't want to go preach forgiveness to them because they're bothering them. Eventually, as a matter of fact, will take them captives. And God says, look, I'm a compassionate and graceful God. And Jonah says, yes, you are. And I'm not happy about that. So he, he goes all the way to the other side of the map in his time, to Tarshish, escaping the grace message that God has given him. Well, the fish swallows him in the middle of the fish stomach. We're told that he prays to God and says, now I understand that you are a graceful God and that you can forgive me and can forgive the Nineveh people and the Assyrians. But he goes and preaches and he gets upset when God forgives Nineveh. But if you finish the story there, you haven't finished yet. So look for a concordance or anything that tells you how Jesus uses the story of Jonah. And you will find something striking that in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus will... Uh, say, people are asking him for a sign of who he is. He says, no sign will be given, chapter 12 of Matthew, except one sign. Let's actually read it. Matthew chapter 12, God says, Jesus says, look, I'm going to teach you the real meaning of the story of Jonah. Matthew chapter 12, I'm so excited with this. I wish we had three days together. <laughs> to talk about all these incredible things. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, okay, I'm going to teach you the real meaning of the story. Verse 38, Matthew 12, 38. Some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign and no sign will be given to them except the sign of Jonah. And what is the sign of Jonah? Here it goes, verse 40. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be where? Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he says, you want a sign of the grace of God? Jesus says, there's no sign other than one sign. And it's the sign of Jonah. As Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of, of the whale, I, the Son of Man, will spend three days on the heart of the earth, talking about his death. And that's the only sign that will teach you how great and incredible and wonderful and outrageous the grace of God is. Okay, there you have it. There's the end of the, uh, the story of Jonah. So when you are teaching anything in the Bible, <laughs> don't forget there is a history of redemption you need to link it to. Because if it's in the Bible, it's because it adds something to the history of redemption. Okay. Now let's do number four because we're running out of time. So the first one was that um, the whole Bible is about Jesus and his sacrifice and what he accomplished on the cross for us. Second is that the revelation is progressive. So we get more and more and more and more. Third is the historical map that know where you are, historical, historical map. Know where you are in the history of redemption in any story of the Bible. Number four is the geographical map. Geographical map. Geographical map. Because the Geography in the Bible will play a role in how God teaches us things. Um, so let me give it to you real quick. 
I'm going to make it very, very simple, okay? This is Egypt. So we're going to do Egypt. This is Israel. Israel. And this is the Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia area is where all the Assyrians and Syrians and Babylon, all that is here. So Assyria and Babylon, all of that is here, okay? Here's the Mediterranean Sea. 90% of the Bible occurs in this map. Only at the end when Paul is going to the rest of the world or when Jonah goes all the way to Tarshish, he goes to the limit of the map of his time, okay? But all the things of redemption that God is teaching us are here. For example, Abraham goes to Israel. When there is a famine, he goes to Egypt. There, the Pharaoh takes his wife and God sends plagues and then the Pharaoh gives him money to leave and so Abraham goes back to Israel. Many hundreds of years later, when Jacob uh, actually not hundreds of years, several uh, generations, uh, Jacob is hungry. He sends his children here. Eventually, the, all the people of Israel move to Egypt. Then the plagues come again, and then people give him money again, give them money again to leave. So we have all these patterns. Why are these important? Because we're either uh, in this journey or to the exile, and all these geographical terms will be used to explain the plan of salvation because this will be the promised land and uh, for example in the book of revelation god said come out of babylon my people from the time of the exile now showing the big topics of the bible see the book of revelation is a book of worship uh, has 16 scenes of worship where the whole cosmos, heaven and earth, are worshiping the Lamb for having redeemed the human race. Okay? Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, but it has more than 400 verses. In English, it has 404 verses, Revelation. But it has more than 518 allusions to the Old Testament. Because the, the last book of the Bible will use all the history of the Bible to explain that God wins that God redeems his people. So it will use again the plagues. Remember in the time of Egypt, it will use the, the word, the lamb. It will use the word of the blood of the lamb. It will use the words of Babylon and how always God redeemed his people from the different places and how all of these things were symbols of the fact that Jesus Christ was the redeemer and through his blood, he got his children back. It, this, this map will help you. Always study the Bible with a map because the map is not simply let's locate something. It's let's learn the patterns of salvation. You know, when, when they are about to cross the promised land, they don't trust God anymore. They have to spend 40 years more in the desert. Well, later on, we understand how you cross the promised land because they took a pa Passover when they crossed over. Um, always a Passover will talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. So learn your geography in the history of redemption so that you don't end up interpreting uh, the Bible in a strange way. Uh, and I know many denominations um, and many groups, even within my own tradition, have, have interpreted these things in a very strange way. When in fact, all these things are pointing to the one way and the only way we can be saved and is uh, through the blood of the lamb. So, so let me finish this one teaching segment once again, reminding us why is it that the Bible has come full circle from the beginning to the end. Let's go to Luke, uh, I'm sorry, to the book of Revelation at the very end. I want to read the last blessing in this book. Um, you know, the book of Revelation, aside from being a worship book, has seven beatitudes. We call them seven blessings. And the last blessing is that the one that we read at the beginning, chapter 22, verse 14. 
Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the, by the gates into the city. And this is where the mystery is revealed, that anyone who calls in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, washes their robes in the blood of the Lamb, will have the right to the tree of life in the paradise of God. I am so glad you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The whole Bible, the whole Bible is about Him.